What is going on, wonderful people? It's Medicosis Perfect Schnellus, where medicine makes perfect sense. Welcome back to my neurology playlist. In previous videos, we've talked about the types of stroke, such as ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke. We talked about the different types of shock, like cardiogenic shock, obstructive shock, hypovolemic shock, neurogenic shock, septic shock, and anaphylactic shock. We had lectures on multiple sclerosis and Guillain-Barré syndrome, myasthenia gravis and Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome, vertigo, labyrinthitis, and Meniere's disease, headache, seizure, febrile seizure, delirium, dementia, Huntington's disease, Parkinson's disease, and dementia with Lewy bodies. In the last video, we talked about carpal tunnel syndrome. Today, it's time to discuss the lumbar puncture. Let me puncture your lumbar. Why do you want to puncture my lumbar? Well, here's the deal. When I stick my needle into the subarachnoid space, I can do two things. I can withdraw the cerebrospinal fluid from your subarachnoid space to analyze that fluid. Maybe because I suspect that you have meningitis, encephalitis, etc. So analysis of this cerebrospinal fluid can be beneficial. It has diagnostic significance. But I can also use the same technique to inject a local anesthetic agent into you. And depending on which space, this could be spinal anesthesia or epidural anesthesia. Click the like button, click the subscribe button, and let's get started. I have several neuro playlists on this channel. The first one is neuroanatomy. The second one is neurophysiology. And the third most comprehensive one is neurology, which contains neuroanatomy, neurophysiology, neuropharmacology, and neuropathology. As you know, the nervous system is subdivided into central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord. The spinal cord is subdivided into many regions. We have the cervical region, which has eight spinal segments, followed by the thoracic region, 12 spinal segments, the lumbar region, five spinal segments, the sacral region, five sacral segments, and just one coccygeal segment. The brain and the spinal cord are covered with meninges. The meninges are the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. Notice this is mater, not matter. Matter is a substance. Mater is a mother. Imagine that you have three mothers surrounding you and hugging you. You have one tough mother, the dura mater, one spider-like mother, arachnoid mater, and one tender, affectionate mother, the pia mater. The dura mater is tough, it's durable. And because it's tough, it's called the pachymeninx. Meninx is the singular of meninges. But the arachnoid mater is thin, the pia mater is thin, so these are called leptomeninges. Lepto means thin. Does anyone remember the hormone named leptin? Yeah, leptin is a hormone that wants you to become thin. It wants you to stop eating. It induces satiety and inhibits hunger secretion. To learn more about leptin and ghrelin and orexin, please refer to my metabolism playlist. As you recall, the nerve has many layers, including endoneurium, perineurium, and epineurium. The epineurium of the nerve is continuous with the dura mater of the meninges. Now let me tell you something that will blow you away. Let's draw the dura mater together. Here's the dura mater. The dura mater is going to surround the optic nerve. Oh, let's follow the dura mater some more. Do you know what the dura mater will become? It becomes the sclera of the eye. The sclera of the eye and the dura mater are one continuous layer. Now you know why meningitis is associated with photophobia and other visual symptoms. Oh, because it's the same layer. See, medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the French toast you're talking about. The optic nerve is covered by these three meninges. If you wish to see more videos like this in the future, drop a brain emoji in the comments. Let's talk about the spinal cord. The spinal cord is the continuation of the medulla oblongata of the brainstem. The medulla is part of the hindbrain. The medulla is going to exit the skull through the foramen magnum and it becomes the spinal cord. The spinal cord, of course, has a cervical part, thoracic part, lumbar part, sacral part, and coccygeal part. In the cervical region, there is a small plexus called the cervical plexus. In the thoracic region, there is a very big plexus called the brachial plexus. And then in the lumbar, there is a big lumbosacral plexus, 
And in the coccygeal, there is no plexus because the brachial plexus and the lumbosacral plexus are so big. That's why there is an enlargement in the spinal cord in the cervical region and another enlargement in the lumbar region. The last part of the spinal cord itself is called conus medullaris, which looks like the bottom of a cone. The spinal cord itself ends at the level of L2 or above, let's say L1 or L2. And that's it. However, the cerebrospinal fluid does not end here. The cerebrospinal fluid continues. As for the spinal cord, after it ends, it gives us this phylum terminale, which will be attached to the tip of the coccyx. The nerves that descend look like a ponytail, so we call them cauda equina, like a tail of a horse. What does equine mean? Horse, bovine, cow, swine, pig, and canine means dogs. If we look at the bony vertebrae, we have seven cervical, we have 12 thoracic, we have five lumbar, five sacral, and four coccygeal. Let's add them up together. Seven plus 12 is 19, plus five is 24, another five is 29, and four is 33. 33 what? 33 bony vertebrae. But if you remember, the segments of the spinal cord were different. Instead of seven cervical as the bony vertebrae, we have eight cervical spinal segments. Twelve is the same, five lumbar the same, five sacral the same, and one coccygeal instead of four. When we added these up together, they were 33. If we add these up together, eight plus 12 is 20, plus 10 is 30, plus one is 31. So we have 33 bones but 31 spinal segments and therefore 31 pairs of spinal nerves. Bones, nerves. So we have a conundrum here, but it's a man-made conundrum. And therefore C1 nerve passes above C1 vertebra. C2 nerve passes above C2 vertebra. C3 nerve above C3, etc., etc., until we go to C7, which is above C7 vertebra. But C8 nerve runs below C7 vertebra. And from now on, every nerve will pass below its corresponding vertebra. So the T1 nerve is under T1 vertebra. T2 nerve passes under T2 vertebra. T3 nerve passes under T3 bone, etc, etc, etc. And then, of course, we'll have T4 nerve, which passes below T4 vertebra to supply T4 dermatome. L4 nerve passes underneath L4 vertebra to supply the L4 skin dermatome. To understand the difference between dermatome and myotome, please refer to my anatomy playlist. Let's zoom in. C1 nerve passes above C1 vertebra. C2 nerve above C2 vertebra. C3 above C3. C7 above C7. But then C8 is below C7. And then starting from T1, the nerve will be below its corresponding vertebra. Here's a cross section of the spinal cord. This is the dorsal root and this is the ventral root. They unite to form the spinal nerve. Each spinal segment will give us a spinal nerve on the left and a spinal nerve on the right. Around the spinal cord, we have the meninges. There is the dura mater, followed by the arachnoid mater, followed by the pia mater. Above the dura mater, there is the epidural space. Under the dura mater, subdural space. Under the arachnoid, subarachnoid space. In this subarachnoid space, we find cerebrospinal fluid. And this is super important. If you wish to download these doozy colorful notes, go to medicosisperfectionalis.com. I help you learn, understand, and pass exams. If you want me to personally tutor you, reach out to me on my website. This is our patient. C7 bony vertebra has its famous spinous process in the back of your neck. You can actually feel it right now. It is very prominent. It can cut through the chase. The inferior angles of your scapula pass by T7. The lowermost ends of your thoracic cage or rib cage is at L1. The iliac crests are at L4, which is a very important landmark. And the posterior superior iliac spines are at the level of S2, the second sacral vertebra. It is the iliac crest and L4 that we care about today. This is the back of a male subject with a gynecoid pelvis. Where is the iliac crest? This is the iliac crest. Oh, so this is the level of 
L4 indeed. So where should I stick the needle of the lumbar puncture? Remember that the spinal cord itself ends at the level of L2. So therefore you do not want to go L2 or above because you will injure the spinal cord. And this is dangerous. And here is one example where music saves lives. To keep the spinal cord alive, keep the needle between L3 and 5. To keep the spinal cord alive, keep the needle between L3 and 5. Why? Why not go above L3? Because you will injure the spinal cord. Why not go below L5? Because there is no cerebrospinal fluid below L5. So you can stick your needle between L3 and L4 or between L4 and L5. This song should be the ringtone of every aspiring neurologist. I think I should create a music album with my dysphonic voice. Look at this. This is the spinal cord, okay? The spinal cord is covered by meninges. This is the pia mater, this is the arachnoid mater, and this is the dura mater. Above the dura mater, we have the epidural space. Below the dura mater, we have the subdural space. Below the arachnoid mater, there is the subarachnoid space, which contains cerebrospinal fluid. But let's go above the epidural space. You'll have the ligamentum flavum. The word flavum, from the word flavio, literally means yellow. So this should be a yellow ligament. And this is where medicosis did an oopsie, because I should have colored this one yellow, not green. Then you have interspinous ligament, supraspinous ligament, subcutaneous tissue, and then the skin of the back of the patient. So if you want to perform a lumbar puncture, we aim at the subarachnoid space. So these are the layers that will be pierced by your magnificent needle. The skin of the back of the patient, subcutaneous tissue, supraspinous ligament, interspinous ligament, ligamentum flavum, epidural space, dura mater, subarachnoid space, arachnoid and subarachnoid space. And there you go. And then you aspirate and draw this cerebrospinal fluid. And of course, we're going to do this between L3 and L5 because to keep the spinal cord alive, keep the needle between L3 and 5 because at L3 to L5, there will be no spinal cord left. You will only have the phylum terminale and the cauda equina. What if I am a doofus and I keep pushing with my needle? Assuming that you are at L3 to L5, you're not going to find the spinal cord, so you will keep piercing the pia mater the cauda equina and the phylum terminale, the pia mater on the opposite side, subarachnoid space, arachnoid mater, subdural space, dura mater, and then before you know it, you will find yourself at the posterior longitudinal ligament, and then the bone. You might hit the bone, you might hit the disc. In front of the bone, there is anterior longitudinal ligament. Now, what if I'm not trying to aspirate and draw cerebrospinal fluid? What if I'm trying to push in something and inject a local anesthetic because I'm trying to perform regional anesthesia, particularly a neuraxial block, which could be a spinal block or an epidural block? By the way, if you want to learn about all of this, refer to my anesthesiology playlist. Regional anesthesia. We have neuraxial block, we have limb block, and we have others. The neuraxial block is subdivided into spinal and epidural blocks. The limb block, we have blocks for the brachial plexus, and guess what? Blocks for the lumbosacral plexus. In order to anesthetize the upper limb or the lower limb, respectively. If you want to perform spinal anesthesia, you're gonna stick your needle into the subarachnoid space and then inject the local anesthetic agent into the subarachnoid space. But if you're performing epidural anesthesia, your needle should go to the epidural space. And to get good at this, of course, you need practice. It's at the bedside where you become a great doctor, not by lying on the couch and watching YouTube. Whether you're performing spinal anesthesia or epidural anesthesia, what you are performing is a neuraxial block, and what you're injecting is a local anesthetic. So the name of the anesthesia is regional anesthesia, but the name of the agent that you inject, the pharmaceutical agent, is a regional anesthetic medication. Back to the story of lumbar puncture. Why do we perform lumbar puncture? Maybe because we're trying to diagnose meningitis or encephalitis or meningoencephalitis. So let's talk about CSF diagnosis in cases of meningitis. Meningitis means what? Well, itis means inflammation. It's inflammation of the meninges. And of course, if I have inflammation, I have what? I have tons of white blood cells or leukocytes. So if we do a lumbar puncture and we find tons of leukocytes, this means 
it could be meningitis. But what if we find uh, almost no white blood cells in the subarachnoid space? Then it's okay, probably not meningitis. Less than 5 cells per microliter is the cutoff value. What if we find more than 5 cells per microliter, then it's leukocytosis. Which means this could be meningitis, but what type of meningitis exactly? Well, let's look at the white blood cells. If they are predominantly neutrophils, then it's probably bacterial meningitis, because it's the role of neutrophils to fight bacteria. But if the leukocytosis is predominantly lymphocytes, that's probably viral or fungal slash tuberculosis. How do I tell the difference? Think about it. Fungi are living organisms. Tuberculosis is a bacteria. It's a living organism. But viruses are particles, not organisms. So therefore, the living organisms need to eat. So they eat your sugar. And that's why the glucose will be decreased in the cerebrospinal fluid. If the glucose in the cerebrospinal fluid is low and the lymphocytes are high, then this is fungal or tuberculous meningitis. But if the glucose is normal, this is viral meningitis, such as herpes. How do I know whether the glucose is low or normal? Let me tell you something important. Suppose that the patient has 100 milligrams per deciliter of serum glucose. Okay. Then the normal cerebrospinal fluid glucose should be 60% of that. 60% of 100 is 60 milligrams per deciliter. This is the normal glucose in this patient's cerebrospinal fluid. But what if I found that the glucose in this patient's CSF is 40? Oh, this is low. So this is definitely something eating up this glucose. Could be bacteria, could be fungal, could be tuberculosis. But if the glucose is 60, normal, this could be viral. As long as we have leukocytosis, of course. Now, in the comment section, please mention five different bacteria that can cause meningitis and five different viruses that can cause meningitis. And speaking of meningitis, I can teach you about the antibacterials, antivirals, antifungals, and antiparasitic medications if you download my antibiotics course at medicosisperfectionalis.com. It comes with videos, notes, and cases. To learn about strokes, myocardial infarction, cardiac arrhythmias, ARDS, acute limb ischemia, and others, download my emergency medicine high yields course at medicosisperfectionalis.com. To learn about neurosurgery, cardiothoracic surgery, trauma surgery, orthopedic surgery, general surgery, and more, download my surgery high yields course. My courses come with videos, notes, and cases. If you value what I do, help me make more videos by supporting the channel. Go to buymeacoffee.com slash medicosis. There are more than 600 premium videos available on this channel when you click the join button and choose the highest tier. Please subscribe, hit the bell, smash like, support my channel on Patreon, PayPal, or Venmo. Go to my website to download my courses, notes, and cases, or if you would like me to personally tutor you. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis. Perfect standards where medicine, chemistry, math, and physics make perfect sense.